All right. So the, the part of the chapter we're going to be focusing in on here is these, these two verses, verses 15 and 16. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. This is a very important statement. This is a, a very important truth and a principle that we need to be analyzing ourselves on a regular basis. It's talking about the difference between the love of the world and the things of the world and the things that this world puts out, the things this world produces, things that are of the world versus things that are of the Father. And it makes a very stark contrast between the two. And it's saying that the one, you know, loving the things of the world and just being all about everything that this world has to offer and what this world puts out, if you have that, if you love those things, the Bible says that the love of the Father is not in you. That means that you don't really love God. Now notice, it doesn't say that that means you're not saved. There is a big difference there between loving God and being saved. Just as much as there's a difference between my children loving me and just being my child. Is it not possible for a child to not love their parent? It is possible. Of course it is. We know that just as much as it's possible for a spiritual child of God to not love God, not to love the Father. And the Bible says, you know, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. We're going to be going through some more of those verses a little bit later. But obeying and following is how we show God our love for him. And that, that shows us that we do really love him. But if we're all about the things of this world, if we're loving the things of this world, then love of the Father is not in us. Now, it lists off three things just kind of further defining what is in the world. What are all these things that he's talking about that are in the world? Because there's some things that I would call benign versus, versus others that are not. And, and that's why there's this further clarification. It says the lust of the flesh. All right, so anything that your flesh lusts after, this is going to be typically, you know, your fornication or maybe alcohol, drug use, things like that. Uh, even eating, you know, certain overeating, things like that. It'll, this is your lust of the flesh. Anything that is going to feel good to your flesh. The Bible says that's of the world. And when we love all these things that just gratify our flesh, and that's what we love, the love of the Father is not us. How about the lust of the eyes? So not just things that are, in, that are gratifying your flesh immediately, looking on things that are, that are pleasing just to your eyes, the things that you look at. And again, this can be things of, uh, you know, um, all, all different types of things. Uh, you know, the, the most common would probably be among men looking at other women or looking at things like that. That could be the lust of the eyes. But that's not where that would, would end. You know, lust of the, of the eyes can be anything that you're looking on. It's a lot of covetousness, things that you look on that you don't have but you want to have things that you can't have, things that maybe you shouldn't have or that you're just physically not capable of getting and you're looking on other things and you're coveting after them. That's the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And this is, I mean, you think about the world and the way I'm going to be applying this this morning, just so you know, you know, th there, this is a pretty broad spectrum of loving not the things of the world, but we're going to be honing in on a particular area and it's going to be on the entertainment industry. Okay, the things that are used for entertaining, which would be typically these days your music and your movies. And there's a big difference between what the things of the Father are and what this world is putting out there when it comes to entertainment. That's why I stopped here when it says the pride of life. Is it really that difficult to understand when you look at the pop stars, the rock stars, are they not all just full of the pride of life? Is that not what they just exude and are all about and how proud they are and it's everyone look at me and how cool I am and how they dress and everything about them is all vanity and pride. 
That is of the world. And not just that, the things that they sing about, the things that they talk about, the things that they are all about and their lifestyle is the lust of the flesh. It is the lust of the eyes and it is the pride of life. These are things that, that we ought not to be loving. Now, no one understands this, I think, more than I do. I, I loved Love, love, love the world's music for a long time in my life to the point where now I have songs committed to memory that are never going to leave that plague me once in a while because it's, I've just inundated myself with all of that garbage, with all of the world's garbage. But we need to be aware of this, that we don't get caught up into loving these things and making that who we are now, um, James 4, 4. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read this for you. The Bible says in James 4, verse 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Some more strong language tied in with, with loving the world or being a friend with the world and the things that the, the world puts out. I'm going to read some more verses for you from the book of John. Just to further drive home this point before I really get in to the meat of what, of what we're covering this morning. Because this is just an important concept that we need to have nailed down and we need to be able to understand so we can apply it in, any, in all areas and be able to apply it appropriately. It's easy, and, and I'm starting off with things that should be very easy to identify. Things that you can just say, obviously, Yes, that's of the world. Yes, Pastor Burzons, I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, the, the wicked lifestyles of these rock stars are all about rebellion, sex, drugs, rock and roll. You know, that's what they do. That's what they're all about. That's their lifestyle. Of course, it's wickedness and it's of the world. I, you know, you get that and you see that. The, the problem comes in with us is when you say, yeah, but I really like the music. Yeah, but I really like the way it makes me feel. Yeah, but I really... Be careful with what you love. You know, if that's the case, I, look, I understand. I understand the carnal desire to, to want to listen to that stuff and enjoy what's being put out by wicked people. But you need to then work on changing where your desires are. What is it that you love? Think about these verses. Think about, you know, well, if I'm loving this stuff, I'm actually at odds with God. I'm actually contradicting what he wants me to do. And I'm actually going to be considered an enemy of God by just indulging and loving all of this stuff and setting my affections on the things of this earth and not on things above. I'm going to read for you starting in John 7. I'm going to go John 7, John 8, John 14, John 15 of all these statements that Jesus Christ himself made about not being of this world. And just, again, further drawing the distinction between this world and the things that are of God. Jesus said in John 7, 7, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works are of our evil. The world, this is why it's at odds with God, because the world hates Jesus. Why? Because Jesus preaches the truth about what the things of the world are actually all about. And it's, and it's no doubt, you, you start going into all of these various the famous rock stars, and you know, I don't care who it is. I'll talk to you all day long about this after service because I know this is something that I, that I have a lot of knowledge on. You start saying, well, I don't know what's wrong about this group or that group. I'll be able to tell you what's wrong with them. At least if it's anything older, I don't know any of the modern stuff, but I'll tell you what, I don't think it's changed. I don't think anything's getting any better than it has been. I look at the world around me and I, I could see the way that the world has been going and it's not been improving. Morals have not been getting better. People's lives have not been cleaning up more and getting cl more closely aligned to the Bible. I'm sorry, it's been getting way worse. So I know the stuff from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, any of the, that, that era, and I know all different genres too. And I'll be able to, to, to pinpoint, yep, here's where they're anti-Christ. Not even just involved in the lust of the flesh, here's where they're against Christ. Because all of the, the, the famous ones are putting out things that are contrary to God and that hate God. 
But that's, I don't want to get, this isn't all just a music sermon. I don't want to get into all that stuff. I've done that in, in plenty of sermons in the past. But um, the Bible says that the, Jesus Christ said the world hates him because he testifies of it, the works are evil. John 8, verse 23 says, and he said unto them, ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. He's talking to the Pharisees. They're unsaved, they're unregenerate. He says, you're of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. And he's warning them. He said, I am not of this world, I'm not from this world. I'm from above. John 14, verse 15 says, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And there we see that, if you love me. So there's a condition there. Jesus may be your savior, but do you love him? He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Then do what I say. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. The spirit of truth comes from the Father. The world cannot receive that. Because, why? Because there's a, a, a huge difference between the things of the world and the things of God. The things of the Father. The world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth it with you and shall be in you. And the things, that, that's why the things that I preach, the things that we put up online or whatever, when the world hears this stuff, they think it's nonsense, they think it's silly, they hate on it, you know, all this other stuff. Why? Because the natural man doesn't receive the things of God. They don't understand it. They can't get it. John 15, verse 18. Again, more words of Jesus. He said, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. And look, this is just a, 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 on a side note. Don't be um, shaken. Don't be shaken in mind. Don't let your faith be shaken or don't be shaken in, a, in this church or you know, with some other people that you may, you may listen to or follow when the world attacks and hates and there's bad press and there's bad stuff on the TV and there's protests or anything else that's going on. Don't let that scare you. Don't let that shake you. In fact, if anything, it should strengthen you. Because you get bombarded with people wanting to tell you, oh, you're associated with them. Don't you know that they're, they're labeled by the Southern Poverty Law Center as a hate group? And, all, you know, and don't you know that they, that they preach this and they preach that? Look, Jesus said if the world hate you, the world. This isn't talking about believers and Christians. This is talking about the world, people that hate God. If the world hates you, just know that it hated me before it hated you. Remember who the standard is. Everyone wants to say, hey, Jesus is the standard. I want to be like Jesus. I want to walk after Jesus. Well, if you're going to walk after Jesus, you know what? Jesus was hated by the world. You have to ask yourself then how closely you're following Jesus if the whole world loves you. If everybody in the world loves you. If you think about Billy Graham who just passed away. How closely was he following Jesus? He was someone who was loved by the world. He, he could be put on all the news channels and everyone would love to have him. He could go preach in any church, any denomination. He went and filled in for the Catholic Church. Yeah, a small clue from there. And you know what? He's loved. Loved, 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 loved. Loved by the whole unsaved world. Loved by the, by the government. Loved by the, you know, the unsaved, wicked government. Hey, yeah, you could be the one that swears in all of our presidents. He's America's pastor. Everybody loves him. Jesus said, you know, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. You know what that's saying? When the whole world loves you, you are of the world. You are not of the Father. Why? Because the world is at odds with the things of God. By definition, that's why we saw all these other verses. We can't deny that truth from Scripture. 
And the closer that you are going to walk to Jesus Christ, the closer of a disciple you're going to be, expect people to hate you. Expect the world to hate you. Yes, hate. Because the world hated Jesus and the world doesn't receive the things of the Father. Satan is the God of this world. That's what the Bible says. Now we know that the Lord is God over all, but power has been given to Satan in this, in this realm, in this world. That's why, that's why when he tempted Jesus in the desert, he brought him up on a mountain. He was able to show him all the kingdoms of the world and say, hey, all of these things have been delivered into my hand. He says, but, you know, I'll give them to you if you bow down and worship me. He was able to, to try to tempt Jesus with that because he did. He did have authority. He did have power over all the kingdoms of the earth because he is the prince of the power of the air. He is the lowercase g God of this world. But his, his time here is limited. But that's why the things of the world are not the things of God, because of the things of Satan. He says in uh, verse 19, If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Do you say they might also persecute you? No, he says they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. He's saying, you're not better than me. And if you want to start thinking that you're better than Jesus, then you've got a serious problem. Because Jesus was hated. Jesus was persecuted. They tried to put Jesus to death. And if you think you've got a better way, no, no, I'm going to make it so that the whole world loves me. Then you're starting to think that maybe you can do it better than Jesus did. And this leads into what the whole, the, the, what, I, what I'm focusing in on this morning. There's a, a new Christian movie that just came out yeah. called I Can Only Imagine. Now, I just heard about it. I mean, there's, I'm so unplugged and detached in, in a sense from a lot of things that go on. So I had to look up a lot of this stuff. But before I even look it up, I already know. I already know. I've already been exposed to enough of this. And I've already seen enough in the Bible to know that's going to be garbage. And it's not something that Christians should be looking after and, and going to in order to see, thinking, oh, well, this is a Christian movie. The idea or the concept behind the vast majority of the Christian music and the Christian movies that are put out there today is this ecumenical view where they're trying to be as broad reaching as possible and trying to just get everybody in and get everyone to agree and just say everyone's a Christian and everybody's good. And it's this, this, this movement that really doesn't stand for the truth at all and they want to be loved by the world and they don't want to offend anybody because they think that they're better than Jesus. They think they've got a better way and they get so worried about offending people that they won't say anything controversial about anything and even when it comes to the truth. What you're going to notice, and I don't even have to see this film to know it, what you're going to notice is that there's not going to be a plan of salvation. There's not going to be an actual gospel taught in any of these films ever on what I must do to be saved and go to heaven. Why? Because that alone is going to bring tons of division. Because the people that think that you have to be baptized to be saved aren't going to like it if you don't put that in there. The people who think, well, you got to at least do some level of works, they're not going to be happy if you don't throw that in there because they say, oh, it's just faith only. No, no, hold on a second. The Bible says faith only. And you're going to upset some other people. You're going to offend a whole bunch of people when you just put in the, the simple truth of the gospel. They can't do that. So what they want to do and what they try to do is just just really water things down to these real base level of, of righteousness and good and bad to the point to where it's really no different than any other movie. Now, 
when we see how serious the Bible treats loving the things of the world and loving the world and that, hey, there's things that come from the world and there's things that come from God and they're two separate things. We should not be loving the things of the world. Ask yourself this question then. If we're not to love the things of the world, if there's a difference, if God has called out to himself a peculiar people, a separated, a sanctified, a holy people that is supposed to be his representatives here on earth, his ambassadors, do you really think it's a wise idea? Do you really think God wants us to take the things of the world and look and produce anything that looks exactly like that and just add Jesus to it? And just say, I'm no different I don't want you to think there's really all, any difference between me and the world except that now I'm going to talk about Jesus. I'm going to put out everything that sounds exactly like the world puts out, that looks exactly like the world puts out, that, that everything is patterned completely after the world. Do you really think that that's what God, how God wants us to serve him? That that's how you're really going to reach people is by saying, look, there's almost no difference between us and the world at all. Or do you think God wants us to say, hey, there's a huge difference. There's a world of difference between the believing and the unbelieving. Between those that love God and are, want to keep his commandments and love the things of God and love the things that the world hates and hates the things that the world puts out. That there is a clear distinction, a clear contrast, so that people don't get confused in their minds and say, well, what's, well, what's the difference then? Why are you any different than me? Why, why should I even bother with the Bible? What's the difference? I live a moral life. I live a decent life. Because there is a difference. There's a huge difference. And we ought not to be patterning our ways after the ways of the world. We ought to be patterning our ways after the ways of God. Now this movie, I can only imagine, is a movie based off of a song by the same name. And this song was produced by a music group called Mercy Me. And apparently they're a very popular con Christian contemporary band. I, I mean, I... I never got into that. Of all the genres that I used to listen to, I never listened to the Christian music because the, the Christian contemporary music was always just a lame knockoff of the world. And I don't see how anyone can't see that. Like, you have the world's rock and roll, you have the world's rap, you have the world, you know, think about these different genres of the world, and then you have the Christian version of that. And it's just like, it's almost the same thing but just, just a little lame. And you know why it's lame? Because they're posers, because they're trying to act like something else. Like something that they're not supposed to be. When someone is called a poser, whether they're faking it, they're acting like someone. Do you have respect for someone who's just trying to be someone they're not? Or do you always tell people, hey, try to be someone who, who you are, not just someone you're not. You know, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, why don't you act like a believer? Why don't you talk like a believer? Why don't you talk like the things of God and have your heart set on the things of God instead of everything about the things of the world? But people have this, this wrong mindset of saying, oh, well, they already like the things of the world, so what we're going to do is take the things of the world and just add Jesus to it, and that way, that's how we're going to be able to reach them. And that way, they're not going to hate us. They're still going to love They're not going to feel rejected or anything like that. We'll still be able to get to them and just, just kind of come in subtly with our, with our Christian version. Is that the way that Jesus operated? I don't think it is. I don't think he tried to do everything in his life as closely to the world as possible, but just insert a little bit of truth here and there. That's not the way he worked. You know, in, in fact, that's why he said, the world hates me because I testify that, that the works are of our evil. He was actually out there preaching that the things of the world are evil, they're wicked, they're wrong, stay away from it. Have nothing to do with it. And that's why the world hated him. And he knew that the world wasn't going to receive that message and that the world was going to re-hate him. 
but he preached it anyways. So, just to prove my point here, this band, Mercy Me, I did, I, I'm going to have some quotes from the band members themselves when they did these interviews with people because I found these online. So here's a, a member of their band for Mercy Me saying, we're influenced by many different genres regardless of their spiritual take on their music. So he's saying the, the music that influences us, the way that we produce music, we don't care about their spirituality at all when it comes to the influence on our music. We, it doesn't matter to us. And it's going to be obvious here in a minute. It says, said Cochran calling from his Nashville area home, we think there's something powerful and special in music in general. You know what? There is something powerful in music. There absolutely is. And I'm not going to go into all the details. I preach an entire sermon on, on the power of music. And anyone under the sound of my voice probably can understand how powerful music can be and how moving it can be and, and how music can actually lead you to do things, lead you to think things, cause you to feel things just by hearing the music. It's very, very powerful. And to say that it's not is, is, is to deceive yourselves. It is. Now, it can be powerful in a very good way. Good, godly music. God loves music. We're going through the book of Psalms. Psalms is a song book. They used instruments. They played music and praised God. We sing songs in church. There is good music and has good benefits and can move you and stir you. Like our songbook says, there's soul-stirring songs and hymns. That's the name of it. You know, it's powerful. It's good. But on the same token, as much good comes from that, the world's music is not good, but it's not any less powerful when it comes to its influence and its impact in our life. And we need to remember that. There are things, and I'll just briefly touch on this, but if you just were to think about what different genres, the spirit that you are filled with by listening to them, rock and roll, the number one thing that comes to my mind is rebellion. Rebellion. Isn't that what it's about in the 50s, 60s, 70s? The rock and roll movement was a movement of rebellion. And there's so many songs dedicated to just rebelling against your parents, rebelling against authority, rebelling against this. That's why the guys are all wearing long hair. Because the Bible teaches us that in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that that is dishonoring your head. For a man to have long hair, it's dishonoring. It's rebelling against God. It's saying, hey, doesn't even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him? Even nature teaches us that. But it's this rebellion against God. It's a rebellion against everything. That's what I wrote. What about, you know, hip hop? What does it cause you to do? It's going to cause people to dance and to grind in such a way that is immoral and not appropriate. And what does it do? It glorifies the love of money and, and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And you could go down the list through the various genres of what it's going to cause you to do and actually get you thinking about, thinking about drinking alcohol, thinking about doing drugs, thinking about fornication, thinking about adultery, and all these things. And it literally comes not just from the lyrics, but also from the music and the way that the music impacts you. It's powerful. But here, so here's what he's saying. We think there's something powerful and special in music in general. There is something powerful. That's why you ought to stay away from the world's music. He goes on and says, when prompted for influences, Concord incites bands such as the Beatles, ELO, Led Zeppelin, and U2. Those are their influences. You say, I thought U2 was a Christian band. Yeah, right. You got Bono dressing up as Satan on stage. I've been to the concerts. I know what they're about. I've listened to their music. U2 who says, you know, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I've held the hand of the angel, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. He said, I've walked with Jesus. I've, I, I've heard all about him, but I still haven't. It's not enough. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Yeah, that's your Christian band, you too. That's what they're teaching and promoting. They're wicked as hell. Led Zeppelin shouldn't even have to go into that. Or the Beatles, the wicked, godless, um, what's his name? Uh, 
Yoko and, and John. Right? Led Zeppelin into witchcraft. Dealt with Alistair McCrawley. Look at, I mean, you can look on their album cover, covers. They've got these, these wicked pagan symbols. Godless. That's their influences. Out of their own mouth. That's the, hey, we want our music is, is coming from and sourced from this music. Is that sourced of God or of the world? Should we be listening to those who are sourcing their music from the world? It's the music, as I was mentioning, not just the lyrics that have an impact. Here's another quote from an article. They have this song called Shake. It says, Shake not only boasts an 80s sound, reminiscent of In Excess. So In Excess, another wicked band, the lead singer killed himself, commits suicide. Sounds just like, hey, hey, do you like the way that this sounds? Well, listen to this group, listen to this song, because it's going to be just like you're listening to the world. Oh, but it's Christian. So you can feel good about it. So you can let your, the, the lust of your flesh just, just give in to all of this sound because we're calling it Christian, even though the source is still of the world. Shake not only boasts an 80s sound reminiscent of In Excess, but is an upbeat tune that invites the listener to dance and, well, shake. Out of their own words. I mean, it's the same concept of teaching. That this song is played in such a way as to get people to move and to shake and to dance. There's something else that the band really looks forward to every night when it performs shake. One of our favorite things to do is look out in the crowd every night and see people dancing. Cochran said, it's awesome. And the reason why I'm quoting this is just to show you, to illustrate there is a lot of motivation, there's a lot of power to the music that it's not just the lyrics. It's the music itself. Now the Bible does talk about dancing. And usually it's not referring to dancing necessarily in a negative light. I believe there is a good way to dance before the Lord. But as with anything, we, we look at there ought to be a difference between the way the world does things and the way God does things. When we sing our songs in church, these hymns out of the songbook, does this sound like anything you hear on the radio today at all? No. It's distinct. It's different. It has its own source. It's a thing of God. There is nothing wrong or wicked with that. That is the right kind of music. I believe dancing, and I'm not going to get into all of the, the dancing stuff, but you, you could you use the principles that we're already learning to kind of figure out whether something's right or wrong. And when someone's sourcing their music from the world, the beats, the melody, everything about the music is sourced from the world, do you think the dancing that is a result of that is going to be a good, proper dancing? I would say probably not. I'm going to skip this reference just for sake of time because I'm spending a lot more time than I thought I would at this point in my sermon. That was, that was page one of my notes. Go ahead and turn, <laughs> turn if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to try to get through this a little bit quicker. If you want to write down a note, you can look at Exodus 32, and it's where I was just going to go into where the, the children of Israel, and they're waiting for Moses. And he was up getting the Ten Commandments from the Lord. And they decided, they're like, well, we don't know what happened to Moses. So they, got, they had Aaron make him the idol. And it says the, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And when Moses is coming down from the mountain, he hears the sound. You know, Joshua's like, hey, it sounds like there's a war or something because there's all this, this, this noise and this uproar. And Moses said, no, 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 that's not the sound of, of, of shouting for mastery, of, of like, the, you know, someone fighting in a battle. He says... That's the sound of uh, singing. So when they, when they went to their idolatry, what did they do? They held a concert. They had this big concert and the singing and, his, you know, his, and, and it was wicked. He gets down there, he's angry and you know, they're naked and partying and whatever. And, it, you know, and, and he breaks the, the, the tablets with the commandments on them and Anyhow, I'm not going to get involved in all that. There's, there's a little bit more there. I'm just going to skip over that. The, um, 
One other thing you'll notice about the Christian contemporary music. Now, we're, we're picking on Mercy Me this morning because they just, you know, there's this movie that that's just came out and it's based off of this one song. But Christian contemporary music in general, you're going to find that they're just completely void of doctrine. Why? Because they're marketing to as broad of a base as possible. Like I said, they don't want to offend. They're not going to have a doctrine. Now, if you've been coming or listening at all to the Wednesday night series, how much doctrine is packed into the Psalms? A lot. It, it, so much so that I believe that the Psalms are quoted more in the New Testament than any other book of the Old Testament in, you know, in the Bible. The Psalms are quoted. The Psalms are talking about Jesus Christ coming. The Psalms are, are you know, all of these various things, all these good doctrines are found in God's music, in God's songbook. And there are a lot of psalms, as we'll continue to see, that will offend people and will divide people and that a lot of people don't want to see and don't want to hear. Now, obviously, there's good encouraging psalms about how, how the Lord's mercy endures forever and he's, you know, these great things, but that is not the sole content of the psalms. It's, it's praising the Lord for his goodness. It's praising the Lord for his judgment and executing justice upon the evildoers. And, and all a variety, a whole host of topics you'll find. But when you look at the modern Christian music, you're going to find that it's void of doctrine. So much so that you can't even get a gospel message out of it. It's very generic and it's also very repetitive. Just kind of saying the same things just over and over and over and over again is vain repetition. Why? Because they're playing on people's emotions. They want you to feel and to have an experience and they're using the music to do it. That's why they're using the sound of the world to, to evoke an emotion in you and then throw in some words that say God or say Jesus without any clear doctrine and it's all just to make you feel feel a certain way and to help them to sell more copies and make more money because the Christian market is a market. Because a Christian wants to say, well, I can see how horrible these people live or, or their lyrics and stuff, so I don't want to listen to that, but I like their music, so I, I'd want to just have that cleaned up version. And there's a market for that. But what I'm teaching is, is, is to not like that stuff at all and like, because that's just patterned after the world, we should be loving the things of God. Think about the way that a patriotic song is designed. It's designed the same way that this Christian music is. It's to invoke an emotional response. Think about songs like, you know, Born in the USA, right? Is that played at like, like every event, every 4th of July, every, you know, anything that would have any type of national pride, you have songs like that. I, mean, I know there's a bunch of others, but that's just a good example of something that's just like, just repeated and this, this concept of, of evoking emotion in you and just to get you to feel the sense of pride in my country and how great the United States is and, all, you know, all this other stuff. That's how the, the Christian contemporary music is designed. It's, it's simply designed to just evoke a, a, a an emotional response to make you think that I feel really close to God. And they want you to think that that feeling that you're getting is, oh, this is of God. Oh, I, I just feel so close to God. And honestly, that's a way, and man, this is turning more into a sermon on, on music. But think about what what, Saul, what happened with Saul? King Saul. When King Saul was being plagued by an evil spirit from the Lord because he wasn't right with God. Saul was not going to the Lord. He was, he was, he was lifted up in his own pride and started backsliding and doing things contrary to the Lord. So he was being troubled because he was a believer, because he was a child of God. He was being chastened of the Lord. And he was being vexed with the spirit of the Lord. But what was his solution? His solution was not to get right with God so that 
he can go back to being in good fellowship with the Lord. His solution was to hire David to play music for him because when he played the right music, the evil spirit would depart from him and he would feel better. So it was a, a wrong solution to his problem. But that just illustrates the power of music even further. That it was able to temporarily put his band-aid on his spiritual problem because it made him feel good. We don't want to solve our problems that we might have with God because we're not following his commands, because we're not obeying him by just getting this feel-good music and say, oh, wow, I'm actually really close to God because I listen to this music every day and I just feel God's presence. Yet, you're not reading the word, you're not doing anything he told you to do, you're living in sin, you know, you go down the list, but you feel close to God. It's a band-aid in masking your real problems. The band Mercy Me has three Southern Baptists that, that are part of the band, at least at the, whatever, wherever I found this information, you know, I don't care. I don't care if it's not the same anymore because people, you know, band members come and gone. They have three Southern Baptists and two charisma, charismatics in their band. Okay, now, I don't know if any of those Southern Baptists are saved because some Southern Baptists have the right gospel and they preach, you know, I don't know. So I'm not going to say that just automatically they're not saved. Like every, you know, I don't know that. And I didn't care to do enough research. And you know, it's also hard enough trying to find a doctrinal statement out of any of these people. You know, they're supposed to be this great ministry and this music ministry and we're praising God and we love God and they don't even have a doctrinal statement anywhere. It's like pulling teeth trying to find out what these people actually believe. Why? Again, because they want a broad base and a broad market because they care about marketing their stuff, not actually being clear and shouting from the rooftops what they actually believe, what they believe to be the truth. It doesn't matter. They just want to sell more of their music. So good luck. Go ahead. Try to find these. Because that's, I tried to find what they believe and I couldn't find it. And I didn't spend tons of time on it, but it's, it's not that easy to, to pull up. It's definitely not on their websites and the things that they produce. But here's another quote regarding the fact that there's three Southern Baptists and two Charismatics in their group. It says, we all think it's pretty funny. Out of the five guys, three of us grew up Southern Baptist, and the other two are Charismatic. When we go to their churches and perform, it's a no-brainer to get them to worship, at least outwardly. It's awesome to see how they worship. They're talking about the Charismatic Church. Why? Because the Charismatic Church is a big circus, right? That's where they have the people, you know, speaking in tongues and all this other stuff. And it's just this big show and it's this big emotionalism type of an event. But here they are. They're just, they're going wherever. They're yoking up with, with, with whoever. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse number 14. The Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And I'm sorry, but the, the charismatics that think that they could lose their salvation are not believers because they don't believe the record that God gave of his son, as 1 John chapter 5 says. They have given to us eternal life, and this life is his son. They don't believe it's eternal. They have given unto us eternal life. If you don't believe it's eternal, you're making God a liar by not believing the record that he gave of his son. Jesus either paid for all of your sins or he didn't. And if he paid for every single one of your sins and you're trusting in that, you have eternal life. But if you think that you could commit some sin or do some other things and God's going to take that salvation away from you, then you're, what you're saying is Jesus, what Jesus did isn't enough. And that you have to add your own works and your own obedience to the law to that in order for you to be saved. That makes you not saved because you're not trusting in Jesus alone. So these people that they're yoked up with are unbelievers. It doesn't matter if they say, I believe in Jesus. Because in their heart, they're not trusting in him 100% completely as their savior. In the finished work of Jesus and what he did on the cross. That's what we need to be trusting in for salvation. He did it. It's done. It's over. And I received a free gift. And that gift is eternal life. By definition means forever. Amen. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? 
And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. God wants his people to be separate. Not to be like the world. Not to be patterned after the world. Not to be yoked up with unbelievers but to be separate. Get away from them. Don't yoke up together and have just great ministry with all these unbelievers. Be separate and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you and will be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Colossians 3.16 says that the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another so here's how we, one of the ways that we teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Songs are meant to be a teaching tool, a teaching instrument. Moses taught the children of Israel a song in Scripture, in God's Word, with God's Word, taught them a song so that they would remember it from generation to generation to generation because music has the power to get into your mind and to get into your memory and help you to remember things when something is put to music. And he did that with a song to teach them and to instruct them and so that they would still have that song even if they turn their back on God and just really get backslidden and, and you know, they'll still have that song as a testimony because it's still God's word and the truth coming through that music. So, all music isn't bad, but when you think about songs are designed to teach and to instruct, we ought to be all the more careful about what music we're listening to. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be taught by people who are yoking up with, with the unsaved world, who people who are patterning their music after the world, and that I don't even really know anything about their background because I can't find any type of doctrinal statement. I don't know what they believe about anything, yet I'm going to invite them into my mind and let them teach me by listening to their music just because they use the word Jesus. That's insanity. At least with the world, you know where they stand. You know what they're promoting. They're out front with it. They're promoting the fornication and the adultery and the wickedness and drunkenness and all that stuff. That's easy to spot. With some of these Christian contemporaries, you don't know exactly what they're teaching. You don't know where they're coming from. You don't know the subtleties that are written into their words because you don't know what's in their heart. You don't know what they believe. And music is written usually poetically or in a manner where it's using language that isn't always the clearest to be able to pinpoint uh, exactly what it is that they're teaching and what they believe. Now, the lead singer of this band, Bart Millard, who I believe is who the, the movie is based off of. It's, you know, this song that he wrote, and it's basically about his life. He, I found this quote from him. He said, When I read Andrew Farley's book, The Naked Gospel, it changed my life. So I started tweeting about his book, that had transformed my view of the gospel. So here's a guy who says his view of the gospel was transformed by this guy's book called The Naked Gospel. Continuing on with his quotes, this is the main thing that I took away from The Naked Gospel is that there's nothing that I can do, good or bad, to make God like me more or less. What are you saying? It doesn't matter how I live. God's going to like me just the same. Is that, tr is that what the Bible teaches? Is that true? No. Why is it that some people, when they get to heaven, he's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Do you think Jesus is going to say that to all of them? No. Why are there rewards given? Some 50-fold, some 20, some 10. What? what it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if I just get off into all the sin of the world. God's just going to like me the same way. It's foolishness. That was his takeaway from this book. But I'm going to get into that a little bit more. Here's one more quote. He says, I came to Christ when I was 13 years old, but somehow I missed the fact. So, so 
he said, here's, he's talking about being saved at 13. Here's his testimony. But somehow I missed the fact that I didn't have to get God's attention because I already have it. Now, what does he really mean by that? I don't know. Was he, to me, this question, did he even really get saved? Because was he trusting in Christ alone or not? It sounds to me like he's, he still thought he had some level of works in order to, to accomplish his salvation. He says, I've been learning that God is basically shouting from the rooftop, rooftops, I have been pleased with you since the day you called my name and I've never stopped. Now, a little bit about this book that, he, that, that transformed this guy's view and what he's teaching in his songs now is transformed view of the gospel. This guy, Andrew Farley, he's a pastor of, of a church, literally, it's called Church Without Religion. That's the name of his church. Church Without Religion. Not so-and-so community church, not so-and-so bad. Church Without Religion is the name of the church. Which I hate this attack on the word religion because the Bible says in James 1.27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. The Bible says that's pure religion. So religion all by itself is not a bad word. But he builds this whole church based on the fact that he's, oh, this is, this is church. We're congregating without religion. So what is he saying? You know what I bet their church doesn't do? I bet they don't visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. And I bet they don't keep themselves unspotted from the world. In fact, I know they don't keep themselves unspotted from the world because he doesn't teach that at all. Because he says you could be just like the world. And I'll show you. You're, you this is going to blow you. I could not believe. I actually found the first sermon. I, I went to this guy's church website. I went to his videos. I clicked on one that I thought that was like, he says like, oh, the law versus grace or something like that. Great. right? I'm thinking this is, this is, this is going to be at least get to the heart of what this guy believes. And it was. I didn't have to do any further research on this. This is going to blow you away what this guy said. It's a total grace versus law fail. Total fail. And he's not the only one that teaches this nonsense and this garbage. But basically what they do, in a nutshell, they take the verses that are talking about being saved. How we are not saved by the law. We are not under the law. When you put your faith in Christ, you're free from the law, right? You're free from that bondage. You're free from the punishment and the penalty of sin because God has washed away all of your sins, okay? That concept. So they use verses that talk about that, but instead of applying it to our salvation, he says, no, that's then after you get saved, you still don't, doesn't, you don't have to worry about the law. You don't have to worry about the commandments. God doesn't want you keeping rules. None of this stuff matters. This is real permissive, just endorsement of sin. And they speak out of both sides of their mouths. But when I, when I give you these actual quotes, because I wrote down his quotes as I was listening to it, it's going to blow you away. He said this, he says, living under the law arouses sin. Living under the law. So living by, yeah, try, let, let that sink in. Try to ponder on that for a minute. Living under the law, living under God's law actually arouses sin within you. That if you're keeping God's commandments, it's actually going to provoke you into doing more sin. That's what he teaches. Living under the law arouses sin. He said, sinful actions, this is another one of his quotes, are actually increased by the law. What he does is he twists the verses that say, you know, without, without the law there is no sin. Because, why? Because sin is the transgression of the law. So he's saying that when, when the law came, you know, sin abounded. But he's taking the verses that are just trying to illustrate the fact that the law just shows us that we are sinners because we break the law. The law isn't sin. The law isn't bad. The law doesn't cause us to be sinful. What it does is it shines a light on us that we are not perfect and that we do things wrong. That's the, the real simple understanding and explanation of that verse. But he takes it to say that, no, the law actually increases the sinful actions. Like causes, it's the causation 
of your sin is from the law. So he said, we just need to stay away from the law then. And the, where he's getting this from, and I said in a week and a half, we'll get into this even more. He's getting it. I, I figured out where he's getting his, his teaching from. It's from the NIV. And this is why, this is why, one of the reasons why the Bible versions are so important to understand why I make a big deal about this. Because this false doctrine that he's teaching, this, this gross false doctrine that he's teaching is coming directly out of this book. He's getting it from Romans 7, verse number 5. If you want to turn there, go ahead and turn to Romans 7 because we're going to look at a couple verses out of there. His quote was, sinful actions are actually increased by the law. And he also quoted, it was quoted saying, living under the law arouses sin. But he didn't just come up with all of this stuff on his own. Romans 7, verse number 5, you're going to be reading it out of the Bible, out of the true word of God. And I'm going to read it for you out of this perversion of God's word. Verse number 5 says, for... For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. He says the sinful passions aroused by the law. So the law is the source of the arousal of sinful passions. The, the illustration he gave is saying, well, if I tell you not to think about a green leprechaun, well, what are you going to do? You're going to think about it. And he, he uses these examples of suggestion where he says, well, if I tell you not to do something, then you're going to do it. To show that, see, if the law says not to fornicate, then you're just going to go and fornicate. Now, if the law, if you, if you look at God's law, it says, don't fornicate. Does that just mean, well, I'm just going to go out and do it then? It's nonsense. It's ridiculous. Faulty logic he uses the, the concept of, of saying something because when you hear someone's words, you're going to think about it. That is a normal cause and effect. It doesn't mean that you're just going to go and do something wicked and sinful that's against the law. We have a bunch of laws of the land. Because those, the state of Arizona has a bunch of laws, does that mean you're just going to go out and break all those laws? No. Any rational person isn't going to think that way. But this is what he teaches. And this is, this, that's literally what the NIV is teaching in this verse. That is what it's saying. That the law is arousing these, the, the sinful actions. The law is doing it. And then look at verse number 8. Because notice in, in verse 5, the King James says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. That does not say that it's caused by the law at all. Verse number 8 now in Romans 7. Of course, the King James says, But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. And notice it says, Sin use the law, right? Sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of confusion. Sin is to blame. Sin is the problem, not the law. And, and uh, their verse says, but sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting, for apart from the law, sin was dead. Now that's much more similar, but what he did in his presentation is he skipped verse number seven. Verse number seven says, because before you get to verse number eight, you got to read verse seven, but he didn't present this. Verse seven says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. And the law is not sinful. I wouldn't even know that I was a sinner without the law. The law is right. The law is just. The law is good. But I am sinful by breaking the law. But he's teaching, well, we shouldn't have anything to do with the law. But you know what? I bet that nobody ever brings their Bible to his church either to even catch that, to even read in context. This is why I also encourage everyone, bring your Bibles. And if you don't bring one, we have them out there for you. We've had them on the bookshelf, and I have one on every single row. 
so that you can follow along and look. And when I go to a verse, you can see the context there. You could take the notes and look. But I guarantee you no one in that church is doing that. Why? One, he puts the verses on the big screen and, and, you know, so that you don't have, you know, oh, don't bring your Bible. I'll just put it up here for you. I'll walk you through everything and just completely leave out the verses. And he also doesn't even give the verse references, I noticed too. When I listen to it, he just says, oh, well, Romans 3 says this, or Romans 7 says this, and he doesn't tell you exactly where in the passage. It makes it a lot more difficult for you to find it if you were going to even challenge them and look it up. He says that Galatians is not just about being saved. He says we are not, he says that, he says we are not to follow the law after we are saved. Not only does he have this shaky teaching, but he actually gets to the point where he says we are not to follow the law after we're saved. That is not what God wants us to do. He says we should just look to Jesus. Jesus is enough. He says, you don't need to worry about the law. Just go to Jesus. Well, what do you think Jesus is going to tell you to do? He says, go and sin no more. And how are you going to know what a sin is unless you know what the law says? He says, we don't need rules. We need to let Christ rule. So these cute little sayings, right? It tickles the ear. The people that want to come in and be like, yeah, man, I got, hey, we're in the New Testament. I don't really need to worry that much about my life. Hey, God knows my heart. So I'm going to go and crack open a beer when I get home from church today. And I'm just going to go indulge myself in the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life in every aspect of my life because God doesn't want me chained down with all these rules, man. Christ set me free. I don't got to worry about that stuff. I just got a good relationship with Christ. Every time I put on my music, I feel close to him. So we're good. We're buds. That is the Christianity that's being promoted by and large today. And I know people are laughing and it sounds like a joke, but it's not. It's actually happening out there. And this is what's being taught to, I, I mean, I have no idea, but this church probably runs thousands. I have, I have no idea. I didn't look up to see how many people are there, but it wouldn't surprise me because people want their ears tickled and not told the truth. He said, we don't need rules. We need Christ to rule. Well, 1 John chapter 2, verse 4 says, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. You can't tell me you know God if you're not keeping his commandments, if you're not keeping his rules. 1 John 5, 1 says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Is the Bible teaching? We don't need rules. Oh, this is the New Testament. John's not saying, oh, don't worry about those commandments. Don't worry about the Old Testament law. No, he's not saying that at all. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. That is what God wants us to do. But this guy's a, a lying, false prophet that's going to split hell wide open with his damnable heresies and doctrines of devils. Romans 6 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Of course we shouldn't sin. Well, how are you going to know what sin is without knowing what the law says? That's the only way we know what sin even is, is by looking to God's law. Romans 6 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. That's his whole argument. We're not under the law, we're under grace. So we don't need to worry about the rules. The Bible says, God forbid that we should sin. 1 John 3, 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. That's the definition of sin. In order not to sin, we need to obey the law. All of that was from the guy that was life-changing in the mind of that lead singer. Does that sound like someone you want to listen to about the things of God? Someone whose view of the gospel is transformed by a guy saying that, yeah, even after you get saved, you don't have to follow any rules or commandments. Does that sound like it's going to help you in your spiritual life? Does that sound like someone you ought to be just, just allowing into your mind, listen to all of his music because it just makes me feel good? Well, I'm going to go and watch this movie because it's called a Christian movie. So it must be good. And it's all about this guy, this lead singer. 
that patterns everything after the world. In the Christian movies, you know, the vast majority of them out there, they're just like the music. They have vague themes of right and wrong, just to be as ecumenical as possible, to get the biggest number of people, to, to market the area. And, you know, it's funny because Kirk Cameron is in a lot of these. And if you see Kirk Cameron, just know it's garbage. Right off the bat, it's garbage. I mean, he's not that good of an actor anyways, but regardless of, of his, his inability to, uh, to act well, it doesn't matter, maybe you think he's great, He's yoked up with Ray Comfort. He does his ministry work with Ray Comfort. Ray Comfort is, is a big proponent of you have to repent of all of your sins in order to be saved. You have to give up your sins. You can't, he, I mean, he goes as far as to tell people, well, if you're not going to give up drinking, you can't be saved. I saw this video of a guy, because he goes out on the street and he, want, he always likes to, to tear people down and how bad sinners they are and stuff. And then his good news is that, well, you have to give up all of your sins in order to be saved. That's his good news. As opposed to, hey, there's good news. Jesus Christ paid for all of your sins. You could just be saved for free. But he didn't believe that. There was one interview I saw where there was, a guy, there was a guy who was actually drunk. But he was professing Jesus Christ. He said, no, man, I was already saved. And he, he believed. He's one saved always. He believed he's saved. And he gave the right answer for salvation. He says, well, no, I'm, I'm saved because Jesus paid for my sins. I put my faith in him. I believed on him. And, and Ray Gumber was confounded, but he could not accept that the guy was actually saved because he was standing there drunk. Well, I got news for Ray Gumber and anyone else who, who believes that way. It's, it's, a, it's false. You don't have to give up all of your sins to be saved. I am a good living example of that. I got saved when I was 20 years old because I did exactly what the Bible said I had to do. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I believed in my heart. I called upon Jesus and I was saved and received eternal life. It lasted forever. It still is going to last forever, by the way. It still is eternal. It was eternal when I was 20. It's eternal when I'm 40. It's going to be eternal when I'm 80. It's going to be eternal in a million years because it never ends. But guess what? There was plenty of times when I was drunk and walking around and having a good time and I was still saved because giving up alcohol didn't save me. Giving up any sins didn't save me because I'm still a sinner. This is, I'm going to close on this. This is my last point. As far as the Christian movies go, you know, that Kirk Cameron, this is, this, is, this is a quote from one of the movies, Fireproof. It says, Cheryl, not, not from the movie, but from someone who's reviewing the movie. Cheryl Dickow of the Catholic Exchange said, I feel it is necessary to send a message to Catholics everywhere that this is a movie worth seeing. You're being endorsed by Catholics. This is a great Christian film. They see no difference at all between what this film's putting out and what the Catholics believe. That ought, that ought to be telling right there. And you know what? That's how all of these things are. I'm, I'm way over time, but this was, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because it's in the news. It's the, it's the newest thing out there, right? I'm sure it's probably playing in the theater in town here. I don't know. But this is just like all of the other garbage that's put out there, that's patterned after the world. It's not patterned after the things of God. And, you know, do what you want to do. I'm not going to make all your decisions for you in life, but hopefully you've at least seen enough scripture about how we're supposed to be separate from the world and not patterned after the things of the world and not loving the things of the world and lust of the world and everything that the world has to offer to not be sucked in just because someone calls themselves Christian. They say it's a Christian movie. They say it's Christian music, but it's completely like the world. Watch out for that. Beware of that. It's not going to help you. If anything, it's only going to confuse you. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your clear teachings from your word. God, I pray that you would please help us, especially, Lord, when, when I know how strong the pull of sin can be in our life. And that, that lust of the flesh, Lord, sometimes it can, it can really get a hold of us. And, and I understand that feeling as much as anybody, dear Lord. But I pray that you would please help us all to be strong, 
be strong in our faith, strong in our spirit, dear Lord, that we could modify our desires to be in line with, with what you would have them to be, that, that we would start to love the things of God. And if that means we're hated by the world, so be it, dear Lord. Help us to be strengthened to be able to deal with that and, and um, to build our relationship closer to you so that even if, if all men forsake us, that we know that you're with us, dear Lord. Help us, help us to truly feel your presence, not because we're listening to some music pattern after the world, but because we're meditating on your word and, and we're doing the things that, that you told us to do so that way we can truly know you and not be liars because we're keeping your commandments, dear Lord, and that's how we can know we know you. Um, Lord, just strengthen us and, and help us in this wicked and perverse generation to be a, a light that would shine unto this lost world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.